Hello, and welcome to the Urban Dharma NC podcast. This is part one of a series in which Dorje Lopan, Dr. Han Lai, teaches about the five Buddha families, a tantric organizing principle for understanding our own original wakefulness. Getting to know the five Buddha families can allow us a better understanding and recognition of the nuances and qualities of our own awakened nature, like a colorless light when refracted. Urban Dharma is a Buddhist temple in the heart of Asheville, North Carolina. We are supported by your generosity and by our online store, TibetanSpirit.com. To learn more about us, come visit our temple in person or look us up online at UdharmaNC.com. Thanks for listening. All mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious Buddhahood. All mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious Buddhahood. All mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious Buddhahood. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Page 6. In the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other perfections, May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. May all mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Uh, Because of the topic of today's um, program, uh, let's turn to page 19 to do the lineage prayer. And then I'll explain you know, once we start uh, what is it about today's program that we should invoke, uh, particularly that we should invoke 
would be lineage teachers. So from 19 to page 31, uh, those of you who are joining us uh, on Skype, uh, you probably don't have this text. So that's okay. You can just listen. And uh, as you listen, you do the supplication together with us. Homage to the Guru in the vast sky of the glorious Dharmadhatu. You pervade all phenomena without center or periphery. Remembering again and again the Dharmakaya great Vajradhara, I firmly supplicate you with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the east over the land of Zahor, where clouds gather, billowing mists of blessings arise. Remembering again and again Dili Ragnabhadra, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the north over Pushpahari, where red lightning flashes, you underwent the twelve trials for Dharma's sake. Remembering again and again, learned great Pandita Naro, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the south of the valley of the birches, the turquoise dragon thunders. You perfectly translated the hearing lineage into Tibetan. Remembering again and again, Marba Lotsawa, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the highlands of the Bachi snow range, a gentle rain is falling, where the instructions of the hearing lineage flow together into a lake. Remembering again and again, glorious Shepa Doji, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the east, the earth on the Dakagambo hills is soaked, with a continuous stream of waters of clear light, remembering again and again the Lord, King of Physicians, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind, Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the land of the glorious Padmodru shoots sprout, where you open the treasure of the profound secret mantra, remembering again and again the Lord, self-arisen Buddha, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind, Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. In the north, in the jewel region, the six grains ripen. These six grains pervade all six realms of beings. Remembering again and again the kind lords of Dharma, uncle and nephew, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. On the crown of my head, on the sun and moon seat, sits my kind root guru, inseparable from glorious Vajradhara. Remembering you again and again, I fervently supplicate with one pointed mind. Guru, please bless me that I may be like you. Lord Vajradhara, Dilipa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Gampopa, Hamagodrupa, Jitin Sunda. Venerable Guru, Guru possessing the three kindnesses, root and lineage Gurus, Yams and Dharmapalas, pray, please bestow blessings on my mind stream. Unequal refuge, ornament of the world, whose renown pervades the three thousand worlds, the undisputed conqueror of Ajadara, I pay homage to you, the Father, Jitin Gumpo. You alone are continually on my mind. Compassionate one, please grant your blessings. Dispel the darkness of my mind. Please bless me to realize the mind free from elaborations. 30. Hold. On the northwest border of the land of Odiana, in the heart of a lotus flower, endowed with the most marvelous attainments, you are renowned as lotus born, surrounded by many hosts of Dalkinis. Following in your footsteps, I pray to you. Come inspire me with your blessings. Guru Bhama Siddhi Om. In the Dharmadhatu palace of Akanishta is the essence of the Buddhas of the three times, who directly reveals my mind as Dharmakaya. O Rud Guru, at your feet I supplicate. Page 43 to 45. Uh. 
This ground sprinkled with scented waters and strewn with flowers, adorned with a supreme mountain and four continents, I visualize as a Buddha land and offer it. May all migrators experience such a pure land. To the gurus who possess the three kayas, I offer the outer, inner, secret, and vastness offerings. With my body, wealth, and all phenomenal existence, please grant the unsurpassed supreme attainment. Whatever slight virtue I may have gathered through prostrations, offerings, confession, rejoicing, requesting, and beseeching, I now dedicate it all to complete awakening. Om Guru Deva Dati Niratna Mandala Pratija Soha. Please turn the wheel of Dharma of the greater, lesser, and common vehicles in accordance with the dispositions and mental capacities of sentient beings. So, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, there's also some people uh, joining us uh, through the internet. Uh, we it's uh, very experimental. We have been wanting to make available because of requests from outside uh, to live cast what we do here. Um, but it seems like all the live streaming ways of using live streaming, at least for us, is a little bit too complicated. Uh, we talked and talked and talked and then talked it to death. Um, and almost taught ourselves to death as well. <laughs> um, but mm, today we're going to try, we're doing actually a low-tech way of getting, low-tech in the, you know, scale of, in the scheme of like internet, uh, which is to use Skype and have people conference in. Uh, so we have a number of people joining us, um, maybe anywhere from five to eight. Um, so, the topic we have for this Sunday and the next two Sundays uh, is basically on the five Buddha families. Now, um, I think, um, I don't know, I, I, I should not assume how much you know or don't know, how much you have read or not read, um, and how much you have attended or not attended, um, but... It is actually, some of you might have noticed that it is actually quite rare, especially in the context of more traditionally trained teachers, to give any kind of, uh, kind of program that is specifically focused on the five Buddha families. Now, you hear five Buddha families repeated a lot. Uh, they turn up, especially in all Vajrayana um, liturgies, in Vajrayana meditations. And the five Buddha families keep turning up again and again. Uh, you hear them in the context of empowerments. Uh, you know, we talk about, okay, now visualize or imagine the five Buddha families coming you know, to the space in front of you, and then they pour this nectar into you, filling you completely with nectar, and you have received empowerment. And of course, depending on how extensive that empowerment is, you might hear that anywhere from one to you know, 20 times, and then you have lost count how many times you have heard about them, and they keep turning up. Uh, but there is no like um, separate text that list them, whereby teachers teach about them. I think a lot of it has to do with the way in which sort of Tibetans learn. And I think now that we are here outside of the Tibetan context, uh, we have to start taking into account how we learn. Um, and so, in some ways, you could say that it's really odd that you have been involved for this long, and I can guess probably that 
you have not had any explicit programs yet saying, we'll talk about the five with the families. If something like that is offered, it's offered by, I think, probably groups like Shambhala, uh, or probably offered more in the context of a lecture in the classroom. It's at Tara Mandala. Uh-huh, at Tara Mandala. So places that are led by non-Tibetan teachers will begin to kind of say, okay, you know, for this audience, if we don't give them this kind of bigger picture, uh, it, 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 it's always going to be kind of puzzling, like, like who are these? Yeah? So I think the other mode of learning, the other style of learning, is like bits and pieces are given, bits and pieces are given, and they kind of come together over time, and then you have kind of an idea of uh, the fact of the families. But that's really not, I think, how we learn. Um, because then it seems like it's just a lot of information that is not exactly connected. We know somehow they relate to each other, uh, but otherwise we don't know much about it. Um, there is also a feeling, I think, among some more traditionally trained and based teachers that says that um, uh, these shouldn't really be taught uh, unless uh, it is in the context of an empowerment. Right? That this is information that should only be divulged in the context of an empowerment. Uh, so that, that does you know, kind of raise a question mark right? as to whether it is appropriate or not right? to present a class on the five with the families. So again, depending on the spectrum of individual teachers you ask, you will have people who will say yes to people who will say no, um, and all in between, depending on context, yes or no. Um, but I do want to say, yeah, there is a question mark. You know, I don't want to you know, pretend that there isn't a question mark as to the appropriateness of uh, kind of directly talking about the fight with the families. Uh, I can say that um, the decision to do this uh, is based on having thought through all the issues that have been raised about why you should or you should not do it. Uh, and so it's not just, you know, like, oh, let's do something. Let's talk about the five Buddha families. Uh, uh, and one of the issues that have weighed or one of the positions that have weighed heavier on this matter is sometimes expressed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama when asked in terms of like, what do you think about the publication of all these uh, esoteric texts and all these explanations out there that you can just purchase on, uh, you know, and buy or read online? He said, well, the information is already out there. Uh, Whereas in the past, it's not so readily out there. And if it's already out there, maybe it is better if um, people who know what these things are make an effort to explain it well. Make an effort, you know, so no promises here. <laughs> uh, at least kind of trying to help the situation rather than uh, say, no, I can't say anything about it, and um, then, you know, maybe more misunderstanding will come out of this, uh, the availability of all this information. Um, so as a result, there has been books that have been published uh, that explain uh, this very well. Uh, for example, I can refer you to... Uh, mm, there is uh, a book, which is actually, this chart here is extracted from there. Um, and then, couldn't figure out how to tag on the, you know, where this is taken from. These three are extracted from a book called uh, The Path of Indestructible Wakefulness. It's a three-volume publication of uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's teachings organized into um, 
the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. And it's called the the treasury of perfect something, something, something. <laughs> and, and the title for this particular volume is called uh, The Path of Indestructible Wakefulness. And in there, uh, this is where this chart comes from. Uh, and these other two, yeah, it's also from that book. And so that book has pretty uh, detailed um, teachings on the five Buddha families. Uh, there is another book which is a compilation. Uh, it's, it's the edited uh, transcripts of teachings that Trungpa Rinpoche gave. Uh, and that book, I don't know if it is published for sale, but it's definitely published as a PDF file. Uh, it's circulating online. Uh, it's something like the five Buddhas and the eight consciousness. Yeah, so that's another book uh, that has very good teachings, information. That one is about. published. Oh, it is published. Yeah. What is it? Trying to yeah. What is it? What's the title? You, you said. Oh, that it's that title. Eight and eight oh, and okay, eight. okay. Because I saw the PDF version before it became a, a book book. Uh, so if you know your finances don't allow you to get the book, there there is a PDF transcript circulating online if you search for that. Um, and in in the case of Trungpa Rinpoche's uh, book. It's more specifically about, uh, it has more of a Mahamudra flavor to it. It's talking about how the eight ordinary consciousnesses, afflicted consciousness, you know, the, the five of the usual, and then the six, which is the intellect, uh, the seventh, which is the, called the afflicted consciousness, uh, the mistaken eye that pops up from time to time, sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker, the klistamanas, and then the alaya, the storehouse consciousness. These are said to be the eight types of consciousnesses that is in operation at all times. Um, for us, for humans at least. And, and that book is focused on how these eight types of consciousness transforms okay, when purified are revealed as the five Buddha wisdoms. Um, and then Trungpa Rinpoche is, is much more kind of detailed. As you look at this list, you know, um, it goes all the way to <coughs> Tathagata, this chart, to wisdom, to klesha, basic energy, color, direction, season of the year, time of the day, element, quality of element, skanda, sense perception, neurotic expression, awake expression, the four immeasurable minds, the activities, the empowerment, the Buddha activity, the mudra, the Buddha's emblem. So, in that book, you know, he goes through all all of this. Um, and in a way, we are going to go through this, but uh, uh, just a disclaimer: I'm not basing it on the explanations necessarily uh, that is in that book. And I'll base it on what I know about this, and and I'll give you that. Um, uh, so, so this is where these material come from. Um, then I think a little bit of just very briefly uh, a history, a, a very brief history of the development of these five Buddha families. Uh, before five Buddha families were articulated the way that it is articulated now, there is an earlier uh, prototype for it, which is the three Buddha families. The three Buddha families. Uh, the three Buddha families are known as the Tathagata family. Tathagata is another word for Buddha. It's an epithet of Buddha. Thus gone or thus come. So there is the Tathagata, uh, that's the first family. Then there is the Vajra family, and then there's the Lotus family. So um, from a historical perspective, uh, these were probably the earliest conception of Buddha families. Right? They are three. 
if you look at later tantric tra traditions of Vajrayana and how it understands these three Buddha families, it says that um, of the four classes of tantras, yeah, four classes of tantra, and that's a basic category. Uh, so you have action tantra, performance tantra, yoga tantra, and unexcelled yoga tantra. Yeah. Action tantra, performance tantra, yoga tantra, and unexcelled uh, yoga tantra. So, so this, now we are fast forwarding to 11th century. The three Buddha families, we have evidence of that from, I would say, 8th century on. From 8th century on. Uh, the five Buddha families, uh, closer to you know, 10th, 11th century, uh, 10th, I would say, even 10th century, you, you, you see the five Buddha families already. And so they say that the three Buddha families are found in the action and the performance tantras. That they use the system of three Buddha families. Uh, in the yoga tantra category, you have four Buddha families. And it's in the, and it's in the unexcelled yoga uh, system where you have the five Buddha families like fully articulated. So his, that reflects pretty well the historical development of Tantra, of Buddhist Tantra. Uh, it, it kind of maps up nicely. Now, of course, from a very conservative or traditional perspective, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni taught all of this. Um, that I leave it to you, what you want to do with that. Um, so, so from an you know kind of an insider's perspective, so to say, we say that all of these were taught by the historical Buddha. Uh, um, but understanding these three, four, five families um, might be kind of interesting as we go further into this material and to see uh, what's going on here. Um, in a way. Not knowing, not having a clear idea about these five Buddha families, mm, makes it rather challenging in understanding uh, many of the things that you will encounter in the Vajrayana teachings. So, Buddha's teachings. Um, in the Nalanda tradition, the tradition of Indian Buddhism that flourished in you know, 9th, 10th, 11th century in India. Uh, in the Nalanda tradition, mm, we say that uh, Buddha's teachings can be divided into three groups. Uh, and there are various groups of three. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you need to write them down you, uh, you, if you want you could but, but each of them kind of have a slightly different emphasis but the basic idea here is that everything that had come under the umbrella of Buddhism everything that has developed in Indian Buddhism from the time of the historical Buddha until 9th or 10th century. All of that. Which means, right, at any given point, there were groups of Buddhists who didn't quite see eye to eye about you know, nuances and interpretations of certain things. And so these were discrete uh, Buddhist communities. Now, unlike Christian denominations, um, there's also uh, quite a bit of going back and forth. Yeah, people might join this community for a while, and literally, it's a community. You live there. Yeah, it's, it's not a denomination. And then, you know, for whatever reason, you feel like, okay, I'm done studying here. 
and then you move to another community. So, but nonetheless, there are these different communities with different nuances and and interpretation of, you know, what the Buddha taught. But by 9th, 10th century in Nalanda, what they have come to understand is that everything, all of these things that have been kind of held, all these different teachings, different understandings, different philosophies held by all these different Buddhist groups, in fact, they are all, they all have a purpose. That the Buddha, the awakened one, actually taught all of this in order to suit the different uh, dispositions, the different capacities, the different likes and dislikes of different beings. And so it's a very typical Indian approach to dealing with differences, which is to take it all in and say, well, you all belong to the same family. And so that's the approach. Rather than trying to you know, stamp something out, uh, the Indian approach, generally speaking, is to embrace all of it and say, actually, all of these are Buddhist teachings. So what they did then from that point on is to articulate that the seeming contradiction, the seeming uh, confusion that you might witness among these different ways of speaking about what the Buddha taught can all be resolved if you know how to arrange them. If you know which are belonging to this first foundational teachings and what are the kind of middling teachings or the body part and what is the apex the top once you know that they say then there are no contradictions and sometimes the the three is explained as um, so that the first one is explained as like almost like three levels of a building you need a foundation you need the first floor, and then you have your second floor. Other times they talk about the three turnings, sort of related to three uh, kind of... It's not literally like three occasions, um, but it's really three sets of teachings uh, that are grounded on um, the first set being... Um, that there is something, there is this body and mind, and we need to be concerned about this body and mind. Yeah? And we also need to see deeper to understand that what we call the I is simply the processes of the body and mind. Upon that basis, we impute an I. That's said to be the foundational. The second is to say, well, actually, if you look further, even these physical and emotional processes do not stand alone. They are interdependent. And even these phenomena, when you look deeper, they too lack substantiality. So that's said to be the second, the middle way. And then finally, the third is that, now before you go too far and think that nothing whatsoever exists, there is also awareness, the mind. And then that's Buddha nature teachings, the third turning. And so they talk about the three turnings. You know, this is a kind of, a, a kind of an oversimplification. And so you have the three turnings. The other one is more the three yanas. The Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, the three levels. Yeah. Um, then you also have the three vows. Uh, which is sort of related to the three yanas, but it seems like what they're concerned about in the, using the rubric of the three vows is slightly different from when they use the rubric of the three yanas. Uh, the, the, the different concerns. Uh, the three vows have more to do with literally the vows. Uh, how do you keep uh, your uh, individual liberation vows in a way that is in harmony with your bodhisattva vows, that is in harmony with your Vajrayana commitments. 
So they talk about the three vows. So here, this topic of the five Buddha families belong to the third. Belong to uh, whether you're talking about the three yanas, or the three vows, or the three turnings. The subject of this series that we're having belongs to the third, the Vajrayana. Okay. And here, you could say that the five Buddha family uh, system is really Vajrayana's most comprehensive way in talking about what we have here on this side of confusion, as well as what it looks like when liberation is achieved. So all that exists in samsara and nirvana is encompassed by this system of the five Buddhas, of these five Buddha families. So everywhere, everything from the psychology of Tantra to the iconography of Tantra to the mythology of Tantra to the practice methods of Tantra and to the theory of Tantra, all of that is based on the system of the five Buddha families. So in a way, you could say, if you don't at least, at least have a a bigger kind of conceptual understanding of the five Buddha families, uh, you're probably missing a lot of things when you are involved in kind of Vajrayana practice, whether doing a practice or going to an empowerment, uh, 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 going to teachings on Vajrayana. If you don't know uh, the system of the five Buddha families, uh, it's it's you know, you're missing a big part. Yeah. Now, what is this not? Uh, this is not, uh, in case you're thinking, this is not quite um, a prediction of what you are going to be. Uh, this is also not about uh, a, f- a fix, uh, kind of like, uh, I'm either this family or that family. But in a way, it is like all these schemes to kind of map out, you know, what personality types there are. It's sort of related, yeah? But this is the Vajrayana system uh, of talking about, you know, personality types. But we will say that, you know, the personality types that are discussed here. Uh, only like you know wh- where there's personality types um, I guess the bias here is to say well they only talk about samsaric <laughs> personality types hmm? not not the enlightened potential that is also in this personality type so I don't know enough about all these other you know Myers-Briggs or whatever to say you know whether they have enlightened versions for you to aspire to or not. You know? but, but here, it definitely has that aspect of kind of telling you something about what, what personality type you might be, you know, might best describe you and therefore help to understand what it is that you're going through now. But it also has the other side, which is that when this is purified, this is what happens. This is what it looks like. Yeah. So in that sense, all of samsara and nirvana can be explained here. Now, of course, all this explanation nonetheless still belongs to this side of confusion. Yeah. So it's not as if right the enlightened can be, the enlightened state can be effectively described with language and ideas. But... Um, some fingers pointing, uh, five, ping, five fingers pointing to the moon uh, is going on here. Uh, so before I continue, any questions or comments or, I don't know, maybe even 
Yes. In kind of like in line of what you were just saying about the personality, uh -huh. would that also mean if you were looking at this, like, um, whatever, kind of, I'm not even sure what you meant by the personality yet exactly, but would that also point to these kind of practices would be more in, in line with that family or that personality that you may be more connected to or feel? Like there is, more? yes, yes. So, oh, so the question about uh, does this kind of Figuring out your personality, say let's what that let's say that's what you're doing, you know, figuring out your personality. Uh, then maybe there is certain types of practices or deities that kind of would complement your personality type better. Yes, except that as far as I know, this is never explicitly discussed in this way. Yeah. I mean, there are so many texts that have mm -hmm. not been translated yet. I don't read these original language. I read some of the original language, but if I were to start reading these texts, it would be too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, as far as I know, uh, they don't so explicitly say it. But then when you observe and see what's going on, that's sort of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So for example... Uh, when you, not in the uh, brief empowerments that we might have gone to a lot, it takes like two hours, three hours at most, one afternoon or one morning, in those empowerments you don't have this, but in things <coughs> like the Kala Chakra, for example, the big Kala Chakra that goes on for three days, of the kind of Vajrayogini that goes for two days, I mean, all of these also have their, you know, shortened version. But these big empowerments, literally, that's what they're called, Wang Chen. There, you, um, there is a divinatory part to that empowerment. Uh, so rather than, um, like, seeing your, you know, guru slash, you know, Psychologist, oh. <laughs> to figure out your personality type. You hold a uh, magic toothpick, and um, during the empowerment, you hold a magic toothpick, and there is a, a, a board painted with this this diagram here, right of the five families, and you like drop the magic toothpick on top from the top, and and where it hits, you know that's your family yeah so it's like the tantric you know sorting hat <laughs> into which house you belong um, and then at other times there's a flower that you offer into the mandala and where the flower lands that's said to be your type yeah I like the flower better <laughs> yeah well, you know, you don't get to choose which ones to use. It's part of the ritual, you know. First, the magic toothpick, and then the flower. Um, so it seems to function like that, but there isn't quite a you know. Let's see, you know, what type you are, and then let's recommend this to you. Mm, there, there isn't a you know Vajrayana teacher secret handbook to <laughs> spy on students and see you know. Um, I think mean, I understand like the Waldorf school kind of have their system of kind of you know mapping out the class like what's what, who is Different belongs types, to which yeah. type, and mm -hmm. then you know to kind of encourage them, yeah. I'm wondering, uh -huh. um, you mentioned that the mandala include, or the five Buddha families include the all of samsara and all of nirvana. Mm -hmm. And is there, um, does it include practices that um, help you go beyond the, um, the, the split between samsara and nirvana and get moved toward that beyond? or the one taste, or, you know, to move to that other level where they're the same, or how... Sure. In a way, all the practices kind of aim at that. 
But first, samsara and nirvana has to be clearly distinguished. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, first, samsara and nirvana has to be clearly split up. Um, otherwise, we could wallow in samsara and think, you know, Ooh, it's now one taste. Uh, I mean, all, all the practices, see, they become one taste when you have completely abandoned samsara. They don't become one taste by mixing the two, and that's a funny taste. <laughs> you know, like rotten food and good food mixed together is not, yeah? So this language of one taste, one experience is, is the one after you have abandoned uh, the afflictive states. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but 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 actually yes, all the practices is to arrive at this, you know, the singularity, so they say, or the not two. Hmm? Uh, but Trungpa is is known to say uh, things like um, uh, he he will say uh, something along the lines of, in Vajrayana, mm, we don't aim for non-duality. Strange. Everybody else says that, you know, it's non-dual. Why would he say that? I think very skillful. He says that actually Vajrayana goes the route of take duality to the extremes. And when you go to the furthest extreme, then you arrive at the non-dual. He says you take duality to the extreme. And, and, and I think well, I don't know whether he meant it this way but I think what in part what he's saying is that it's not necessarily by kind of blurring the two see there, there is the sort of seeing that there's only one person there by blurring your vision and there's another way of seeing that there's one person there which doesn't, it's not about blurring the vision. So Vajrayana kind of takes it very clearly yeah, that there are two. And you take it to its kind of like logical and then absurd conclusions. And then you kind of, th- these two kind of implode. Yes, at least that's how he phrases it. Yes. The Dalai Lama, <clears throat> this is from Randy. Mm-hmm. The Dalai Lama did the, she's talking about the divination, uh-huh. did this at the last Kala Chakra. He chose one representative who chose um, for the family, for the whole group. Yes. How, how can that apply to thousands of pe- people? Mm, it doesn't. Uh, often these types well how can that apply to thousands of people oh, of course wait let me answer that of course it can apply to thousands of people it can apply to a bazillion number of beings right even if it seems like at the Kala Chakra there were 20,000 20,000 compared to infinite sentient beings is nothing <laughs> right so on the one hand you could say uh, that all the people gathered here have the karma at this point. Mm-hmm. Because, because this is not permanent. Yeah? It's, it's not like you belong to this family until you're enlightened, you're this family. But right now, this is what you're working on. So there's that. There's also the practical side of giving empowerments to 20,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> So you have one representative. But it's not totally just out of convenience. Because it is about, well, well, sure, why not? You know, 20,000 or 200,000 could have the same family. And they all get it, you know, for the 4th of July barbecue called Kala Chakra. (laughs) The whole clan is there.
uh, as I said, you know, like there is no particular systematic way to introduce the five with the families. Uh, so I don't have a template or model that I'm working from for, for this, you know, program that we have. So I don't, you know, I don't have something clear planned in my mind how this is going to proceed. But maybe let's start with these diagrams, yeah? So first this diagram here. Um, now, there are the two sides to it. You know, this, is, this is the most basic mandala that you're going to see where they're painted with ink and color or painted with sand. This is the most basic mandala. What you're seeing here is uh, a circle with then uh, these kind of four quadrants, right? So at the center is the wheel, and then east. Mandalas, the layout of mandalas is such that no matter what, the quadrant that is closest to you is always called east. Yeah? Regardless of wherever they're placed, the quadrant that is closest to you, that's always called east. That's how they're oriented. So east is the Vajra, yeah, you see the Vajra? Right? And then south is moving now clockwise to the next quadrant. That's the jewel. And then moving clockwise to the third quadrant, that's the lotus. And then moving you know, full circle, you come to the next clockwise, that's the crossed Vajra. Yeah, so these are the four directions and the center. <coughs> That's the basic five uh, groups, the basic five families. Mm, just if you're interested, uh, what you're seeing in the next circle is a circle of lotus, and then the next circle is a circle of fire. And these are the kind of the protective devices that protects the mandala. Okay, now if you turn to the other side, we'll have the basic five with the families and all the groups of five organized there. So the family in the center is called the Buddha family. The family in the east is called the Vajra family. And Vajra, uh, this is a symbolic Vajra. This is a symbolic Vajra as a ritual item. Uh, this represents, so the original Vajra uh, comes from Indian culture. And at least pre-historic, historical Buddhism, um, the Vajra is said to be the weapon held by the Indian king of the gods, Indra, pre-Buddhist. Uh, Indra, king of the gods, is said to have a Vajra, and the Vajra is said to be the most powerful weapon that existed anywhere. Um, so with Vajrayana, with Buddhist Tantra, uh, surfacing, uh, it takes that symbolism of the most powerful mm -hmm. weapon, uh, and even the name of the tradition is called Vajrayana, the Vajra vehicle. So, what it represents is indestructibility and invincibility. It cannot be defeated, it cannot be destroyed. And then, what is that? Variously, sometimes it is said to be the wisdom mind, and sometimes it is said to be compassion. So it's a symbol for that. So this is the Vajra in the Vajra family. Uh, then, in the next, in the southern direction, so you see uh, east, south, west, north. In the southern direction, the family there is called the Ratna family. Ratna is jewel. 
the Jewell family, Gretna. In the western direction, the western quadrant, is the Lotus or Padma, the Padma family. <coughs> you look at this diagram, each of the quadrant from Vajra down, one, two, three, four, five. And you have scepter, jewel, lotus, and then on the northern is the cross Vajra, or sometimes represented by a sword. And then in the center, the Buddha family is represented by a wheel. So these are the symbols of the five families. What's north again? Hmm? What's north? It's right there. Look. Oh. You see the diagram? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh huh. Or cross yeah. budget. Yeah, it's all here. Nothing to write. Uh -huh. Just. Question. Yes. About the Vajra. Uh huh. Is the thing you held up, uh, this picture shows it not in touching. Uh huh. I've heard it referred to as five spoke Vajra. Yeah, you so. Yeah, so this one, um, I, I kind of, you know, um, what you're seeing in this picture here is kind of an artistic representation of a Vajra. So, Vajras, they say there are single spoke Vajras. Yeah, so Vajra that is more like a stick, yeah? single spoke. Uh, there is a, a three prong or three spoke Vajra, which this looks like a three spoke Vajra, yeah, it seems, right? And they're not joined, right? Uh, and those, the three spoke Vajras are said to be the extremely wrathful Vajra. That's, that's what they call it. Then more commonly is the five spoke, yeah, with five spokes. So four, uh, four on the four directions, one in the center. In this case, even this, now this single ritual implement is the, becomes a representation of the five Buddha families. Uh, so that the top, the yeah, there is top and bottom for Vajra, very subtle. Uh, the top is the five male Buddhas, and the bottom is the five female Buddhas, and the five wisdoms. Um, then there is also Vajra with nine prongs, uh, nine spokes. One, three. Five and nine. And you see at the bottom of these prongs are these lotus petals. And so this represents the lotus, lotus seeds of the five Buddhas, the five male Buddhas, and the lotus seeds that support the five female Buddhas. Thank you for listening to the Urban Dharma NC podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll consider supporting our mission to foster a deeper understanding of the teachings of the Buddha, to build meaningful community, and to integrate contemplative teachings into everyday life. We invite you to make a donation online at udharmanc.com or make a purchase at our store, tibetanspirit.com. Thank you. May all beings benefit.